Uh, thanks very much. You can call me in, that's okay, just don't call me late for dinner. Uh, I like my food, that's why I've got to exercise. I really want to thank the PCFA actually for inviting me to come and speak to you today. Uh, we wouldn't have a research program if it wasn't for the PCFA. PCFA took a risk on us, we were untried, and we wanted to do research around exercise as medicine for prostate cancer. And coming up eight years ago now, they gave us a substantial grant to do some high risk research to see if it would actually work. And at that time, no one else in the world had actually done the type of exercise research that we were doing with prostate cancer. So thanks very much, John, and uh, to the PCFA. OK, I've got a lot to talk about, so let's get rolling. Look, this is a landmark paper. It relates to prostate cancer. It was published by colleagues of ours actually at the University of California, San Francisco, led by Stacey Kenfield and June Chan. And this is an outstanding outcome. What they showed was that men that did a certain amount of vigorous exercise each week reduced their risk of dying of prostate cancer by 61%. That is an enormous improvement in outcome and survivorship. Vigorous exercise is the key. There is something about vigorous exercise that provides an enormous protective effect. We have to find out what that is. What is happening in the body and happening in a, at an epigenetic level with vigorous exercise that actually changes the outcomes for prostate cancer. Okay, I'm going to talk about the side effects of uh, firstly androgen deprivation therapy which has been the main body of our research over the last eight years. Please, this applies to all cancers though. What I'm telling you today, it doesn't matter. Of the hundred cancers, this applies to every single one of them. All of the position statements come out and they say to avoid a rest strategy. No matter what the cancer, what the treatment, what the stage of the journey is, you must engage in regular physical exercise. Otherwise, the outcome will be far worse. So a number of uh, actual adverse side effects occur with androgen deprivation therapy, which is the frontline treatment for prostate cancer currently. Prostate cancer cells proliferate in an environment of testosterone. If we use pharmaceutical products that either block the release of testosterone or they block its action in the cell, then we greatly reduce the activity and can really slow down the progression of the cancer for a certain time period. But of course, taking testosterone away from a man who's had that circulating in his blood for 50 or 60 years has devastating effects on all of the body systems. Now this includes muscle loss and we lose, lose large amounts of muscle very, very quickly because testosterone is very anabolic. So that results in loss of strength. And that, of course, causes decline in physical function. Now, combined with this, testosterone is highly neuroprotective. One of the main drivers, for example, of uh, Alzheimer's disease is the reduction in testosterone as we get older. So taking it away pushes the guy through considerable cognitive decline, but it also affects the motor areas of the brain as well. So balance is affected. Now you've got a bad situation here where they have less muscle, less strength, poorer balance, they're much more likely to fall. Some of the other side effects that occur is this overwhelming fatigue due not only to the cancer, but also the various treatments, including ADT. But of course, radiation therapy and chemotherapy also considerably elevate the amount of fatigue and many patients report this to be the most debilitating problem that they have with cancer and its treatments. The concern about metabolic syndrome as well, heart attack, stroke, type 2 diabetes drastically elevates when the man has testosterone suppression but also testosterone is critical for the maintenance of bone health and bone tissue. So I'll show you some data later where removing testosterone moves them very quickly towards being osteoporotic. So you've got a problem here, they're weaker, they're more likely to fall, they're more likely to fracture because they have weak bones. If you're 70 years of age and you fall and fracture a hip, you are unlikely to survive the next 12 months. So that's a, that's a consideration because did you die of prostate cancer? No, you died of hip fracture. So one of our first studies with our clinical colleagues was to launch an analysis of the first 36 weeks of maximum testosterone suppression here and to have a look at what changes were occurring. And the first thing we see is that the drugs are very, very effective. If we have a look at testosterone, it's dropped it down by 93%. So essentially it's taken the man down to being castrate, chemically. And the good outcome though is PSA, which as you all know is an indicator of prostate cancer cell activity if you like. Also. 98% reduction, so it really settles down the prostate cancer. The problem is, 
36 weeks, these guys lost 2.4% of their whole lean mass. The muscles in their arms and legs dropped by 4%. Their fat mass increased by 14%, particularly abdominal fat around the waist. And that is why these guys are dying at an earlier, uh, earlier time because of the onset particularly of cardiovascular and metabolic related diseases. So we had a look at these issues and we said, wow, <laughs> all of these seem as though they would actually be benefited by physical exercise. Now my background is in exercise physiology. I've been in the exercise area for 31 years now and mostly working with elite athletes, Chicago Bulls, the uh, Australian uh, swimming team, etc. Manchester United now. <laughs> no, I don't work with Arsenal. <laughs> I would if they paid me. But what I did was take all of the knowledge that we'd learnt. We've learnt an enormous amount about the human species in how it responds to exercise because we wanted to understand the basis of improving athletes. So we've taken that knowledge and now applied it to the patient population and the transference is amazingly effective. So we launched a series of clinical trials. The first one was with one of my PhD students, Daniel Galvao, now a full professor, very bright lad. But he, uh, we initially did a very small study. It was a single, um, a single group study. Here only 11 guys with prostate cancer. Uh, they're all receiving androgen deprivation therapy and we had them lift weights for 20 weeks. The first question we want to answer was, firstly, would they do it? Secondly, would it break them? Would they have problems with it? Would they tolerate it? And then the big question, if you lifted weights with these guys, if they don't have testosterone and they have cancer, can they actually get stronger? Now at this time it was not known. No one had done this sort of intervention with cancer patients, in particular with prostate cancer. Most of the exercise studies to this point in time were with breast cancer and they used aerobic type exercise. Well I'm pleased to report that we had increased in muscle function, physical performance, their balance was improved, their muscle uh, size was improved. Their strength was improved. You might think, oh, strength, who cares? You know, I'm not, I don't want to be uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't want to get in the movies. Uh, I don't want to hang down on the beach lifting heavy things. But muscle strength is an underlying factor in physical function. It is the number one predictor of whether you will develop metabolic syndrome. There's reasons for that. It's around muscle mass, and I'll come back to that at the end. I think it's an important story to tease out here. But also muscle strength, of course, is a uh, very big uh, predictor of a whole range of other disorders that you might develop. Now, we did, we did actually show in this study that, yes, men, even though they have no access to testosterone, can in fact get considerably stronger over a 20-week resistance training program. None of them broke either, so they will tolerate it. So this encourages us to launch a much larger study here, and this was uh, uh, involved 57 men. They were randomly allocated, so this is a proper randomised controlled trial where they completed 12 weeks of resistance exercise and aerobic exercise as well. So resistance exercise is lifting weights, aerobic exercise is like continuous exercise like rowing or cycling or jogging. That's the protocol. Our main outcome here was lean mass. Can a man who does not have testosterone actually respond by increasing the amount of muscle that they have? This was not known at this time. Okay, we know in older men, and we've done a lot of research in, in older men, we've shown marked improvements in muscle size in older men who do not have cancer and who do not have testosterone suppression. So this was a key question for us to ask. Well I'm pleased to say that on average they increase muscle mass by one kilogram. One of the guys put on four kilos of lean mass. So yes, men, even though they're on testosterone suppression, can still increase muscle size uh, with the appropriate program. Strength increased, aerobic capacity, some nice, Im nice improvements in balance and also quality of life measures, particularly around general health and reduction in fatigue. Sorry I'm going fast guys, but I've got a lot to cover, lots of things to tell you. Okay, so let's have a look at the actual changes in body composition in this study. And the first one is whole body lean mass, and we see um, around uh, 750 grams of lean mass, which was quite encouraging. So yes, they can increase their lean muscle mass, no change in fat mass, no change whatsoever. This was concerning, these guys normally if we were working with older men, who did not have cancer and were not on testosterone suppression, they would lose some body fat. But the, taking away the testosterone seems to override that and makes it very difficult to shift uh, body fat in this patient population. That means that we're going to have to look at other strategies, uh, in particular uh, greater aerobic exercise and also some form of dietary restriction. I want to get across the point today that exercise is not a single pill, it's not aspirin. 
Okay, it is a whole range of different drugs and depending on the mode of exercise and how the actual uh, prescription is given gives vastly different effects on the body. For one example, if you change the rest period between sets of lifting weights between one minute versus three minutes, you have an entirely different endocrine response in the body. So exercise is not a single drug, it's many, many drugs and they can also be prescribed in many, many different ways to get different outcomes. So let's change tack for a moment. I just want to talk about uh, bone health and ADT. This is some data here showing that in normal men here who have not received androgen deprivation, about 35% of these men at that age will have osteoporosis, 45% will have osteopenia, which is the earlier stage. Years of androgen deprivation, you see here, by the time you've been on ADT for 10 years, every single man will have either osteoporosis 80% of them and around 20% will have osteopenia. So they all have major bone health issues. So we launched on a study to try and overcome this because once again, research that we'd done um, back in the 90s had shown in menopausal women that we could actually stop bone loss through appropriate exercise. Walking was our control condition because it doesn't have any effect in terms of preserving bone. Weight training actually was effective at preserving bone in menopausal women. But we've also, one of our collaborators uh, now at the University of Queensland, Professor Dennis Tafe, has been using this type of exercise called impact exercise to uh, get a very good osteogenic effect. Now, I point out, don't try this at home, okay? These guys are six months into their program. They've had a long preparation working closely with an exercise physiologist to build up their strength, build up their connective tissue before they move on to this type of impact exercise. So don't just launch into this, please. So what were the outcomes? Well, what we saw here, this is usual care. And with usual care, in uh, as little as six months, mind you, they lost over 3% of their bone mineral density in their spine. That's a catastrophic loss. If you had a look at menopausal women at this stage, they'd be losing about 1%. So these guys are losing three times what a, a female will during um, menopause. Disturbing for me is that resistance and cardiovascular exercise had no benefit whatsoever in terms of bone. It did not attenuate the bone loss. So although it's been shown in a whole range of other patient populations and healthy populations to be effective, in men on ADT it cannot overcome the testosterone suppression. However, the good news is that impact loading combined resi with resistance exercise totally blocked the loss of bone, so it preserved bone. This was a world first. Um, no one else has been able to show this. We've just got a paper in review on that at the moment the jumping exercises that you saw. So the skipping, the hopping, the exercises like that. You've got to actually load the skeleton with changing force to actually cause that osteogenic effect. It's a good question. Now, this next study uh, is one which was funded by uh, PCFA, and once again, I've got to acknowledge their support. But this is to look at a metastatic disease. So this is guys that are more advanced, and traditionally, they have been advised to avoid exercise. They have uh, here, you can see bone lesions. This is the original um, uh, cancer here in the prostate and it's actually metastasized in this particular gentleman to the rib here. Now they're told to avoid exercise for fear of spontaneous fracture. They have lesions on their bones. That area is weak. If you stress it too much, it'll produce a fracture and you've got all the, all the complications that go with that. But avoiding exercise, as we know, is not going to work. You will only decline faster and so we have to get these guys exercising. So what we proposed to the PCFA was what we called a multimodal exercise program by which we actually, uh, this is the uh, protocol paper which we published in BMC Cancer, what we did was actually plan the exercise around the bone sites where they had lesions. So depending on where they had the, the, the uh, site of the uh, metastases, we would then adjust the program accordingly. Interestingly, a paper which has come out this year, very recently in a mouse model, where they implanted breast cancer cells into, uh, into the bones of mice, they showed that if you load the bone, it actually uh, considerably suppresses uh, tumour development. So there is something, uh, we may have to re re, uh, actually revisit this, we may have to produce some loading through the bone because only that will actually suppress tumour growth. Resting the bone will probably cause acceleration of tumour growth. So, the question with this study first off is would these men actually tolerate doing exercise and would we have any adverse events? Well I'm pleased to report first off adverse events during exercise zero. 
Okay, so uh, in a well-controlled environment, monitored by accredited exercise physiologists, we had no problems there. Would they actually do it? Well, yes, they would. The average attendance was 20 sessions out of a possible 24. In fact, 70% of the participants completed the whole 24 sessions. So yes, they will do it. Will they work at the appropriate intensity? Yes, they will. This is a rating of how hard they found the session and it was right within our target. So they will work at the appropriate level, they can do it. Tolerance of exercise, where zero is intolerable, seven is highly tolerable. The average rating was 6.1. They reported, yeah, I can do this, it's fine. I can tolerate it, no problems at all. If we have a look, a big concern was monitoring bone pain here, average of all sessions, where 10 is severe and zero is none, the average was 0.6. So it doesn't appear to actually uh, exacerbate their bone pain. And if we have a look at bone pain actually negatively affecting their ability to undertake exercise or daily activity, none, zero. So we we're quite pleased with this. It doesn't appear as though an appropriate exercise program will actually exacerbate their uh, bone metastases and bone pain. So look, I, I, hate, I hate when I put graphs like this up. I'm sorry, but this is fresh out of the lab, okay? So I haven't had time to actually put it into a, a nice figure. Um, but what I just want to demonstrate to you here is the next question, well, would these guys, who are quite unwell, would they actually respond to an exercise program? I'm pleased to say that they did. This is between baseline and post-exercise. So over the 12 weeks of the intervention, we see strength has improved, uh, walking ability, endurance, and also their fast-paced walk. And in fact, this is a, at six months follow-up, they still retain that benefit, which is a great outcome. The other aspect here is that their lean mass increased at, uh, at immediately post and was also maintained uh, six months afterwards as well. And the reason for that, if we have a look, oh sorry, I'll just show you the bone density data first. Bone density, not increased at 12 weeks, but you wouldn't expect that. It takes longer for the bone to respond, but very pleasingly is their bone density was actually increased at six months follow-up. And the reason for that is it actually changed their behaviour. The 12-week intervention actually changed their behaviour such that at six months follow-up, their level of exercise, and in particular their resistance exercise, was significantly higher. So they developed the habit and they kept it on, and that's why we got such beneficial effects. I want to change tax and uh, talk about sexual activity. And the reason for this was actually a consumer um, conference that we had on the Gold Coast a few years ago. And we presented all our bone stuff and our muscle stuff, and guys came up to us and their partner said, yeah, 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 it's very nice, very interesting. But one of our major concerns is around sexual health. Now that surprised us, um, you know, these are old guys and we thought, well, maybe it's not that important to them, but it is, it is really important uh, to them. It's probably even more important to their partner. Um, but guys on ADT, you know, you take testosterone, libido really drops off, okay? So we want to see, well, if we put them through an exercise program, will it actually be beneficial to what they consider to be very, very important? A study came out this year indicating that men would sacrifice a 10% reduction in survival if they could maintain sexual function. All right, so a lot of guys are quite prepared to give up the fact that they might die so they can keep sexual function. It is important to them and their partner. So this is a paper we published earlier this year in Prosthetic Diseases. And this is just quickly going through some of that data. We have here uh, the exercise group here, pre uh, and then post. And then this is the control group in the, uh, in the gray bar here. So what we see, any interest in sex whatsoever, we see about 50% here uh, in, the, in the two groups. And the exercise group actually went up. Not significantly, but it was a small subject sample, but it did go up, whilst the control group went down. We did get some significant changes in terms of having, you know, expressing a major interest in sex. And it was only about 20% uh, here to start with. But exercise actually maintained that interest in those guys. But for the control group, they all dropped to zero. At the end of the 12 weeks, none of them had a major in interest in sex. If we have a look here at some, uh, in terms of their sex actual sexual activity, we see exercise here. This is pre, both groups are about the same here. And then when you have a look at post, it's been maintained in the exercise group, but control group has dropped dramatically. So their actual sexual activity has gone from 20% down to only around 10%. So it's actually halved over 12 weeks, whereas the exercise actually prevented that altogether. 
So what we wanted to determine was well, how, what was actually driving this. It's interesting because one of the main drivers, if we have a look at the correlation between sexual activity and general health, there's a pretty reasonable relationship here, indicating that the guys just felt better. They felt more healthy when they did exercise and that, one, that encouraged them to engage in greater sexual activity. In particular, their role emotional in, was related to sexual activity as well. What that is, is that the guys felt more empowered they felt more uh, masculine by doing exercise. You get a bunch of guys, put them in a gym, lifting some weights, okay? Um, it, gets them, it gets them, they feel more masculine. Now, of course, energy deprivation has a strong feminising effect, which has a whole range of influences in terms of their psychology and their self-esteem. Getting in the gym lifting weights makes them feel better, makes them feel more masculine. They go home, their wife taps them on the shoulder, and they go, yeah, why not? Okay, and it does actually increase their sexual activity. We actually did this by questionnaire. I didn't actually go out to people's homes. <laughs> now, I want to finish off with this. We have a focus and fascination in this country about obesity. The fact is, adipose tissue doesn't produce a lot of chemical messengers. It's a pretty inactive tissue. It just sits there and you've got to drag this thing around with you. We need to focus on muscle. Muscle is an extremely active tissue. In a normal weight individual, the muscle system makes up 40% of your total mass. That is a huge part of your body weight and your physiology. Now this is a recent paper published at the end of last year. And what it is, is explaining that muscle contraction and interruption actually results in autocrine. That means it's releasing chemicals within the cell. Paracrine, it's releasing chemicals to the cells that are around it. And endocrine, that is, it's releasing chemicals into the circulation which are travelling to every single tissue in the body. So muscle contraction and repair affects all the tissues in the body. Muscle, fat, nerve and bone. <coughs> we have a big problem in this country with sedentary behaviour. Imagine what happens to this system when you spend your whole day sitting down and the muscles are not contracting. It is a major interruption to our normal physiological processes. Now what of course drives this is the amount of muscle. So we have a problem because as we get older we reduce our muscle mass. We are more sedentary so our muscles are getting smaller uh, and smaller. And also different training parameters, different ways. Remember I said exercise is not a single drug. It's a very, very complex interaction of all these systems. And through different types of exercise, we can produce changes muscle hypertrophy, but also we can change the way in which the, ac the muscle actually responds and the chemicals that it releases into the system. And as I say, they affect all of the systems of the body. So I believe that a very fertile area for research will be to try and understand why, and this is slide number one, you remember the Kenfield paper, 61% reduction in prostate cancer death. We have to understand why. How does the system produce that? Now, our colleagues, particularly at the University College of Dublin, suggest that it is the myokines and hormones that are released from muscle under contraction and repair, which are actually impacting directly on the tumour cells to suppress their growth. It's a very good story. We need to understand what, we don't even know what chemicals they are yet. We've got an idea, but we need to find out what those chemicals are, what their action is, for two reasons. We can then design exercise programs that actually suppress tumour growth, but then we can use those models to develop drugs which can mimic those effects as well. Okay, so it's a very important model that we have to explore because it could actually provide considerable opportunities for um, uh, curing prostate cancer. Uh, as always, uh, <laughs> I just stand up and present the information. Uh, it's my colleagues that do all the work. Um, particularly um, the, these guys, Daniel Galvao and Dennis Tafe. Our clinical collaborators here, we, we wouldn't have a research program if it wasn't for the fact that medical oncologists, urologists um, and uh, radiation oncologists actually agree to work with us. Otherwise you don't have a research program. It's that interaction between clinicians and scientists which is really, really important. And I've got I to gotta thank the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. Once we wouldn't have a research program. They took a risk on us. They invested some money. I hope they got a return. Um, but because of that, we've been able to leverage money from the Cancer Councils, uh, AbV, which is a pharmaceutical company, Cancer Australia, we've got a quite a large grant with them now. We've got NHMRC funding. We would never have been funded by the NHMRC if PCFA hadn't taken a risk and actually given us some money because they thought we had some good ideas. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.
Look, look, it's a part of a whole package. We have to have a holistic approach. Um, I think another, we're working very closely with, for example, Suzanne Chambers, and she's a, a very well published professor in psychooncology. We also have to control stress and anxiety and depression as well, because those psychological factors actually influence the release of these cytokines and these hormones. Cortisol, for example, goes through the roof when you have depression and anxiety, all right? And that's, a, that's, a, that's probably driving a lot of these changes. So we have to have a holistic approach. You have to get your stress down. If you have depression, you have to get that in control. You have to have a, an adequate diet. We know that muscle grows much more effectively if we feed it the right things. And there's a whole science around when you feed it and what you feed it as well. So yeah, diet is really, really important as well. So it's the whole pick, uh, package. Until we have a holistic approach to the problem, while we're just like, you know, the guys are over here ferreting over here digging on this bit, the guys are over on the other side of the bridge digging on another part, you'll never get a, a bridge built, okay? It's until we actually get all of these come together in, in a truly integrative approach that will actually solve the big problems. But good question. In, in all of our studies and in, in the way we operate our clinic, uh, getting people to exercise is, is the big challenge. Uh, I think by putting the fear of death into them, uh, by talks like this, helps. But also uh, getting them into group environments, supportive environments. We have guys that have been with us for 10 years now and they keep coming back twice a week. They go, you know, they go and have a cappuccino after the session and some days they go and have a beer. It doesn't matter because they're turning up and doing the exercise. You have to get into a group. Get with your partner's great. I exercise with my wife as well, and otherwise I, I wouldn't go either. <laughs> they're, they're two really good questions. The, the first off is an accredited exercise physiologist is minimum of four-year university trained. They're not gym instructors. Uh, gym instructors maybe have a six-week course behind them. I mean, anyone can go and do a six-week course and hang up a shingle and say, I'm a personal trainer, okay? They can't do, and do that and say, I'm an exercise physiologist, all right? For the same reason, I can't go out and say I'm an oncologist, all right? So the first thing is actually find an accredited exercise physiologist. If you go to the, uh, our website, which is um, ESSA, e -S -S -E -S -S au, you can actually find an exercise physiologist. If you type in Exercise and Sports Science Australia into Google, you'll find it. So first off, get with an accredited exercise physiologist. They're appropriately trained. If you just go off to a gym instructor, then some things could go wrong. It, mostly they don't, but you don't want to be that one person. Um, your second question around funding. Uh, look, a couple of, about four or five years ago, um, Tony Abbott, actually, when he was health minister, actually added exercise physiology to the Medicare system. And so exercise physiologists will have a Medicare provider number. So you go to your GP and say, look, I want to get rolling in a, an exercise program because I've got cancer or I've got diabetes or whatever. They can write you what's called an enhanced primary care plan. And they can, give, they can recommend up to five visits per calendar year with an exercise physiologist and Medicare will rebate most of the cost of that, uh, of that consult that you have with it. So that's probably at the moment <coughs> the best way to go. Some private health insurers, a lot of them also will rebate um, uh, exercise physiology services. Look, it wasn't so long ago, when, when I first started in this game, okay, uh, if you had a heart attack, the recommendation was go home and rest. Go and lie in bed or sit in a chair. Unfortunately, we tended to have those people back about six months later with a, a, a repeat um, infarct, um, or they died. Um, cardiac rehab's changed entirely. I mean, two days, three days after the, the, you have a heart attack, we've got you up and walking. The physios have got you up doing exercises, all right? Very shortly after. We now even put them into, I mean, we run a, 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 a stage one, two cardiac rehab centre where we are. We have them uplifting weights and everything. If you... Take a rest strategy, you will only die earlier. All the research shows it. 